today's scripture. Isaiah 63, 7 through 9, page 741, and in the large print, 1069. I will tell of the kindnesses of the Lord, the deeds for which he is to be praised, according to all the Lord has done for us. Yes, and the many good things he has done for the house of Israel, according to his compassion, and many kindnesses. He said, surely they are my people, sons who will not be false to me. And so he became their savior. In all their distress, he too was distressed. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and mercy, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. Matthew 2, 12 through 33 page 1160 and 1498. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled also. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. And when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets. He will be called a Nazarene. This ends the reading. All right, good morning. So, first, thanks to Sarah. That was awesome. I love the song, and and you really did a great job. So, I don't know where you are. (laughs) You're not. (laughs) Oh, okay. Well, if you can see us on the monitor, (laughs) thank you. Um, They have a monitor in the kids' room, so... Anyway, um, that was great, and thanks, Susan, for reading. Um, so it's, and now um, we're on to our service. It's up to me. Um, I feel like when I was a little kid, um, you know, you get, you're a little kid, you get the Christmas outfit, right? And you got to wear it to church because it's a Sunday after Christmas and stuff like that. Well, I am wearing my Christmas outfit, <laughs> everything but the shoes. So, um, yeah, it's tradition in our family to get underwear, so yay. <laughs> so like I said, everything but the shoes. <laughs> I know, too much information, but, you know, <laughs> if you wanted a filter, you shouldn't have asked me. 
So um, we get gifts for Christmas, and I thought I'd share one of the one of the more special ones that, that I got this Christmas was um, as a part of this outfit, I got this tie. So I open up the tie, and it looks like a pretty unassuming blue tie. I have been wanting a plain tie because apparently now the thing is to have plaid shirts, and you can't really wear like a plaid shirt with a plaid tie because then people like go all buggly eyed and have seizures when they look at you. Um, but um, so I open it up, and I'm like, oh, great, a tie, you know, like. Um, but my wife said, well, look at the back of it. I'm like, why do I need to look at the back of a tie? It looks like the front of a tie. But it's kind of neat. It's from a, a company called 21 Rhinos. Um, and on the back in this little part is a picture of my wife and three children. Yeah. So to me, I only have to wear ties at work. Um, but to me, it's kind of like I carry the reason I go to work with me at work. Um, because... You know, Christmas is a time where we get blessings and gifts, and one of the greatest gifts that was given to me was the, the gift of me being able to be a husband and a father. So, um, so I thought I'd share that with you. If you want to see the picture, um, you can see it on the way out. <laughs> I, don't, I could take it off and we could have show and tell. You could pass it around. So um, it's something kind of ordinary, um, like when Jesus came, turned into something kind of sacred. Um, so it's Merry Christmas to those of you that I didn't get to see, you know, before Christmas, and Happy New Year to those of you I won't see before New Year's and things. Uh, we made it through Advent, and, you know, we, we had our hope and our peace and our joy and our love. Uh, we got to Christmas, we had our, our presents and our carols, and um, some of us maybe, when I was a little kid, we used to have a uh, uh, birthday cake for Jesus. Um, it's a great reason to have cake. So, um, and you get presents. Um, and just, I don't know if I, I shared last week with you, but uh, when I was doing the services for the, uh, the seniors at, at Elder One, um, our theme for Advent was regifting. And uh, because each week we would go over a certain thing, whether it be hope, peace, joy, or love, and, and just to share it with you, like what we would say is that Jesus never gave us anything he didn't expect us to give away. Because ultimately, when we're given the gift of hope, it's not just so that we have hope, it's so that the world has hope. Amen? The same with peace and joy and love. So, for those of you who may have regifted this holiday season, know that you are just being Jesus to the world. And if you received back a gift maybe you gave last year because the people forgot who gave it to them, know that they were just being Jesus to you. Amen? Amen. So um, we made it through the silent night, the go tell it on the mountain, the the angels, and uh, the three kings, right? Like all those different carols that we sing. Um, I came across a story about a uh, Sunday school teacher. And she was sharing the story of Jesus. And, you know, you should, in Sunday school, you share that every year. So she thought, you know, the kids are young, but they've heard this every year. Let me just kind of see if, as I go, I'll ask them some questions to see if they know the next step. So she said she got to the point where the, the three kings came to visit. And, and she said, uh, you know, what do we call those three kings that, that came to visit Jesus? And a little five-year-old piped up, and he said, maggots. <laughs> She was a little taken aback, but just kind of gently corrected him. And she said, well, it's, it's really magis. <laughs> but what did the magis bring? A- and the little kid was all excited. He said, I know, I know, I know. He, they brought gold, Frankenstein, and Smurfs. <laughs> so um, I don't know about the, uh, the Smurfs, but, but I do know, actually, in this story... Um, Herod kind of was like Frankenstein, the monster, right? He was a pretty bad guy. Um, so we'll learn more about that in a minute. But, you know, the, the title of the sermon is Returns and More Returns. Um, so I looked it up, Christmas Returns. And do you know that there's all sorts of strategies and tips? I, I Google searched Christmas Returns. Do you know that there's 115 million results? Now, I'm pretty thorough, and I want to make sure I'm prepared. So 
I assure you, I read all of them. No, I didn't. <laughs> but the titles were interesting, right? Um, there was five tips to Christmas returns. There was um, an article about the official return day. Uh, you know how they have official everything day, as, every day as an official something day? Well, December 26th is the official return day. Um, and because they're the most, it, it's actually the day that retailers have the most number of returns. You know, because obviously Aunt Betty bought you a sweater that fit you two years ago and is two years ago styles and things like that. By the way, clothing are the, the number one thing returned. Um, there's over $70 billion worth of merchandise was returned on that day. Um, now, here's a tip for all you husbands. I, I think you need to maybe, all of us husbands, I, I'm included, um, but all of us husbands maybe need to be a little more discerning in the gifts we pick because uh, somehow they figured out that 42% of women return the gift the husbands gave them. <laughs> yeah, I don't know where they came up with that statistic, but... Uh, um, the funny thing is 79% of husbands aren't even aware they did it. No, I'm just, I made that up. <laughs> um, but here are some of the, the crazy return stories I sh thought I'd share with you from the retailers. Um, one of the, the big things that Costco gets back are dead plants. Well, it, it was supposed to be alive. It died, you know. Like, I, um, at one point, somebody got back a smelly safe. And you think, well, how could a smell safe get smelly? They returned the smelly safe. They say, I don't like the safe anymore. Well, it's because the safe smelled like marijuana. <laughs> like, how did it get that way? I don't know. <laughs> um, one person returned a, uh, he got a, a vacuum pack steak, and he returned the bones and the gristle. Um, a woman forgot about some fish that she had in her freezer for 13 years and returned it. Um, here was a clever guy, right? He returned his laptop, his new laptop, right? And they scanned it all in. Yep, absolutely. Came up as a new laptop. Well, when they sent it back to the returns department so they can check it over and see if it's just something they can, you know, put back on the shelf or whatever if it needs to be. What they realized was that absolutely all the stickers came up as a new laptop. That's because he peeled the stickers off the new laptop and put it on his eight-year-old laptop. Um, one person held on to the receipt for their boom box. If you don't know what that is, that's because it was 10 years they held on to the receipt um, and then tried to return it 10 years later. Here's the funniest thing, I think. The... Uh, a woman returned an empty bottle of wine. You know why she said she was returning it? It gave her a headache. <laughs> okay. So, so Christmas can be about returns, right? Um, and I think in this story, there are some returns. Um, you know, Jesus returned to where... The original exile came from in Egypt, and then he returned back, and then, you know, um, some different things. But, uh, you know, I think really the overall arching theme of, of what we're talking about here today is, is a return to reality. Uh, because the reality of it is that, that Jesus came, and we celebrate a joyous, wonderful day, and, and generally we have peace, but... Jesus came to a broken world. And this just thrusts us back into the, the, the brokenness of it. Um, and this year it, it hit home for me a little bit more about how we have the, the respite of the Christmas and then right back in. Part of it's just because of where Christmas was. It was in the middle of the week. And, uh, you know, I worked Monday and Tuesday and Thursday and Friday. So it was kind of like we were just speeding past Christmas and sort of <laughs> took a ticket and went on the toll booth or whatever. I don't know. It was really, it was like kind of like tag you're it and we're past Christmas sort of thing. But another part of, of kind of being thrust back into the reality of the fact that, that we're in a broken world was, you know, the fact that, that I 
a few months ago, I started working as a chaplain in Lifetime Hospice. So just the reality of visiting with so many families where this is going to be their last holiday, there's not a doubt. It might be their last holiday in some cases. Um, not because they'll make it to another one, but because they might not make it to that one. Um, and really the reality of, and it hit home, hits home for a lot of us too, the reality of this broken world is that, that we do, a lot of us suffer losses, and, and it, it comes to mind whether it happened at this time of year or not. So, um, so this Christmas, this story, we'll see what the story has to, to say about being thrust back into a broken world after maybe the beauty of a, a, a celebration of a birth of a child, right? Um, to put it into context a little bit, Matthew, um, as we know, he was Jewish, uh, and the, the book of Matthew, the purpose, um, Matthew wrote it with God's guidance and wisdom, and, and, and the reason why God chose Matthew to write to the Jews is because uh, he could write to the Jews about a lot of different um, prophecies and a lot of different references that would essentially show Jesus as the Messiah to the Jews. Now, in the other Gospels, they, they, they may focus more on including the Gentiles and things. Not that Matthew didn't. Matthew worked his way to it, and at the end, you know, obviously we were, he was a, you know, a savior for all nations at the end. But in Matthew, um, there's three prophecies in this particular passage. Uh, in Matthew, in total, the book, he made 16 references to Messianic prophecies. If you want to compare that to the other Gospels, if you combine all the other Messianic references in all the other three Gospels, um, Matthew's is double that. Um, in Matthew's writings, there's a lot of different, if you're, if you're researching a sermon, there's a lot of different rabbit trails you could go down because Matthew really uses a lot of the different types of writings. Like he parallels a lot of different stories. He uses a lot of cultural references for the Jews. Um, for example, in this story, the story of Moses and Jesus parallel. Moses was sent down the river to avoid being killed by the Pharaoh. Jesus was sent to Egypt, where Moses was, to avoid being killed by Herod. Um, and God's provision in the face of, of horror. Um, as we work through the passage, we look at, you know, first, obviously, God sent a message to the, the wise men, the magi, and, and they went back a different way, which just annoyed Herod. I mean, Herod was not a nice guy. Um, Ironically, does anybody know what the name Herod means? Hero. And even more ironically, in the historical writings um, of the of other than the, the Bible, the, the writings in history, they would call him Herod the Great. Um, that was actually more a reference not to his character, but to his accomplishments as in terms of the the wealth he was a he amassed as a ruler. Um, so, as I said before, he's more like a Frankenstein's monster, or a Grinch, because he really, he tried to, to steal Christmas away from, he tried to steal the gift of Christ away from the world, um, because he was paranoid. And um, he was paranoid about a lot of things. He, uh, he actually even killed off close family members because he was afraid that they would infringe upon his, his power and authority. Um, but God had a plan. God sent an angel to Joseph in a dream. Again, another one of those parallels. Because in the Old Testament, what did Joseph do? Interpreted dreams. Right? And in the New Testament, this Joseph... Well, to us, it's a nice coincidence a little, and, and we can read into that. To the Jews, it really hit home for them because that's the kind of thing that happened throughout the Old Testament is that, that stories paralleled stories, paralleled stories, paralleled stories. Names meant things and stuff like that. So, so that was significant, that it was Joseph, that Joseph was getting the warning in a dream. Uh, Joseph was obedient. He took his family 150 miles to Egypt. Now, 
We remember the story of Moses, so it might seem a little bit strange that he was going to Egypt, but it was actually kind of a, a normal place for, for Jews to go for refuge because there was actually, where he went in Egypt, there was a million Jews. Uh, because in the, the silent time of the, between the Old Testament and New Testament, the prophets were silent for 400 years, right? God didn't speak for 400 years. In that time, there was a lot of wars and there was a lot of separation and, and you know, exile and, and people. And so a lot of Jews ended up there in Egypt. And it was a place where they could be Jews and not be threatening to anybody. Um, now, this is a prophecy fulfilled um, from Hosea. And uh, it said, out of Egypt, um, out of Egypt, I called my son. And it's, it's actually a little strange. It's kind of a prophecy, but more like a promise. Um, and if we think about what the book of Hosea was about, um, it, it helps us to, to really kind of recall um, what this promise was all about. Um, now, he was bringing Jesus to Egypt so he could come out of Egypt, where Moses came out of Egypt. And what did Moses do? He delivered the Israelites from slavery. And what Jesus will do is he'll deliver God's people from the slavery of sin. Now, the interesting thing that, that he brings up this promise from Hosea is that, that the book of Hosea was all about, um, it wasn't about, a mess, it wasn't a messianic like book necessarily. What it was about was God's unconditional love in the face of rejection, in the face of unfaithfulness, Right? Because Hosea had the wife, Gomer. Gomer was unfaithful. Perpetually. Gomer had children that weren't Hosea's. Hosea took them in as part of their family. He, he even had a kid that he named, not my kid. So... But I think it's significant, and it would have been significant to the people that Matthew was addressing, that in reality, this is about this baby being the unconditional love of God. That's going to ultimately, what Hosea did for Gomer was ultimately bought her out. He redeemed her, where Jesus is going to redeem, just like Moses, but just like Hosea as well. Amen? So Herod realized this. He came up with a plan. His plan was, didn't work, right? Um, so the first thing that, that happened in Jesus' life, well, the first thing that happened in Jesus' life was he screamed because he's a baby, uh, and all babies scream when they first come out. Um, it's interesting that we could say that the first thing Jesus did was cry out for the world. Um, but so the first thing they did is they sent Jesus to the exiles, Right? These are people that probably are awaiting a Messiah as well. Delivered them. Now, the next prophecy, a voice is heard, by, uh, is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children. Um, now, this is another prophecy. Uh, a prophecy that's significant for a couple different ways because Rachel, first of all, um, Rachel wept at the exile, right? Um, and, and that was, Rachel had kind of become um, the official representative for grief. To understand true grief was to understand Rachel's grief. So when, whenever they reference that in, in terms of their, their speeches, their talks, their, their stories, um, she was kind of like the, the poster child for grief in the, the um, Jewish culture back then. But also, um, what it did is it, it returned it back to the exile. Um, see, and to the, the lineage. See, from Abraham to David, there was 14 generations. From David to the exile, there was 14 generations. And from the exile to Jesus... Who brought back? See, in the exile, the Davidic line of, of, you know, King David was lost. In those four, 14 generations in the exile, like that Davidic line, it wasn't lost, but it was, it was lost in terms of its power. 
right? Um, Jesus brought all that back. So again, to the Jews, that was really significant that all those generations matched up. And really, I think it also shows the, the, the grief um, to reference that is to understand the grief that although Jesus was saved, there was still some lost. So God was still crying out for his people, even in delivering his son. Um, because in reality, again, Jesus entered into a broken world. And, and when Jesus came, it wasn't the promise that everything would, would be smooth sailing forever. It was just the promise that maybe we wouldn't be alone. Maybe that we would have a refuge in our storm. Um, Herod died, Joseph obeyed again. They, w- they were going to go back to where they came from, but they were afraid of Archelaus. Um, he was Herod's son. son. Uh, the thing to understand about him is that like, he was just as bad as Herod, except he wasn't as smart. Herod was really bad, but he was also really smart, and he was able to, to amass a big fortune, amass some great power. But I guess the best way to describe him was he was unpredictably tyrannical. It made no sense. He was just out of control. So, again, he went to to Nazareth. Went to Galilee, went to Nazareth. Now, therein lies the third prophecy that was fulfilled. But there's a problem. It's not a prophecy anywhere in the Old Testament. So what was Matthew talking about? Well, I think that this kind of also is, is another way that... See, Jesus did come to fulfill the prophecies. But he didn't come to fulfill man's interpretation of the prophecies. He came to fulfill the, the messianic prophecies in God's interpretation. So in a lot of ways as you walk through the different Gospels and the way Jesus acted, while he he did fulfill some prophecies, he also turned their expectations upside down in a lot of ways too. Now, some would say this is a little bit of a play on words because um, Nazarene sounds a little bit like Nasser, which is a word for root, and you know it would say that he would come out of the root of Jesse, but in fact, if you, if you look a little bit deeper into some of the, the, uh, the majority of scholars would say that what this is more a reference to, because um, in Matthew's writing, he doesn't say what the prophet said. He did name that this is, you know, we know that the first prophecy was from Hosea. We know that the second prophecy was from Jeremiah, and he said the prophet. Here he said the prophets. Um, and really what what a lot of people say, and, and I guess what I would, I would believe in a lot of ways, is that um, it's more of one of the things that Matthew understood being part of the culture, um, and he was more trying to incorporate a lot of different things that were said about what the Messiah was going to go through, a lot of things that were said in like Isaiah where it said he would be despised and rejected, and, and a different place where it said he would be cut off and, and insignificant, basically. Um, because... Nazareth was tiny. Um, it was not even listed in the towns, in historical towns. That's how small it was and how insignificant it was. Um, and now, if Jesus came and was called a Nazarene, and he was a Nazarite, um, Nazarites were they were set apart um, and holy. We could probably say that about Jesus, right? But also, if they were going to fulfill their calling, they couldn't cut their hair. I don't know if Jesus had a haircut or not, so he might have done that. He might have not cut his hair. Um, but they also weren't allowed to touch the dead, and they weren't allowed to drink wine. So I think, in a way, this is Jesus fulfilling a prophecy that he was going to come. And he was set apart and holy. 
but not in the way that the people thought. Because, in fact, he came for us, and, and we essentially are dead in sin, right? So if he didn't come to touch us, if he didn't come to touch the dead, then who did he come to touch? And ultimately, if he didn't drink wine, how would we share his shed blood? So I think in a way, he fulfilled a prophecy, but he also flipped some human expectations on their head. All in doing that. So this story really um, kind of takes a lot of the, the Christmas leading up to Christmas, hope, peace, joy, love, a lot of the, the beauty that was in all of those, those things um, and, and the, the birth of Christ and the Christmas story um, kind of thrusts it all back into the reality of a broken world. Just like us in the aftermath of Christmas can be thrust back into a broken world. Because we might be able to take a time out and have Christmas Day and, and kind of separate ourselves from some of the, the stuff. Um, but in reality, sometimes when we're thrust back into our lives, we are in exile. We are separated. We do feel alone. And we need to know that we're not. Sometimes we are feeling insignificant like those people in Nazareth, the insignificant little town. Sometimes we're feeling like we don't matter. And we need to know that we do. And sometimes we are in the face and we're sorrowful. And sometimes we are weeping for God's children. Just like Rachel. The weeping that goes beyond consoling. Because the reality of life is that this is a broken world. The reality of life is that, that we do go through disappointment, we do get overwhelmed, and we do suffer loss. And, you know, we as a church family have, have lost somebody that, that a lot of us really cared about and, and grew to know just in the past week. And, and I think uh, so it can really hit home how, how broken the world can be. But just like in this story, if we take the message out, um, Jesus came not just for the least of these, but this story helps us to know that Jesus came from the least of these. Um, and because just like Moses delivered the, the Israelites from the slavery, Jesus has delivered us from the, the bondage of sin, right? Because he took the lead. He went to Egypt. He took the role as representative for us. Just like God cries out, comfort, comfort Israel. Jesus came to give us comfort in the face of sometimes unspeakable brokenness, unspeakable loss, unconsolable. Jesus came to be with us. And in the face of all that, he can be present in us and with us. And if he is present in us and with us, then God provides a way. When we don't know a way through, God does. When we can't take a step, God can. And most importantly, I think, most importantly in this, this, this whole message is that Jesus asked Peter a question. Do you love me? Peter said yes. What did Jesus tell him to do? Feed my sheep. Most importantly, because Jesus is with us and in us, in the midst of this broken world. He also works through us. Um, there was a deacon, not at this church, at some church in the Midwest. I read the story. Um, but the, uh, the church was wondering, he wasn't doing necessarily all of his deacon responsibilities. So the pastor wanted to engage him in something, you know, 
Um, and so he said, all right, you know, like, um, we have a youth group that goes and, and does a service for the seniors um, once a month. And could you drive them? They don't drive, and could you drive them? So he went and drove them. And uh, he would sit in the back and just listen to the thing. And then when they were all done, he'd, he'd drive them home. And uh, the one time when he went, he would just sit back with his arms crossed and just kind of relaxing, not indignant. He just was passing the time and listening to the service. But the one time he went, he heard a little, or he felt a little tug on his arm. Um, and he looked over, and there was one of the seniors, a gentleman. He, uh, he reached out his hand, and he held his hand for the whole service. And that repeated for several services that they did. Every Sunday, he would go, the guy would come, tug on his shoulder. They'd hold hands for an hour during the service. After the service was over, he'd drive the people back. Um, the one day he went, though, and, and uh, the man wasn't there. He didn't feel the tug. He looked, the man wasn't there. So after the service was over, um, he went to find the man. He asked where his room was, and he went down the hall and... Uh, you know, he, uh, they said, oh, well, the man's in his room. Um, he's passing away. He said, oh, okay, um, can I go see him? So he went down to the room. He reached out and held his hand, and uh, he said a prayer with him. And as he finished the prayer, he, he felt the man squeeze his hand. So that was confirmation for him. So he felt really good about, you know, doing that and, and going and being with the man, that, that his presence meant something. On his way out of the room... Um, he ran into one of the daughters. And the daughter said, oh, thank God you came. He was waiting for you. He said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, Dad told me he was waiting for Jesus to come hold his hand. What do you mean? I'm not Jesus, you know. He said, well, he said that, uh, you know, every Sunday when the kids came to do a service, Jesus came and held his hand for a whole hour. And he was waiting because before he left, he wanted to hold Jesus' hand one more time. You see, Jesus didn't come just to be with us and in us, but he came to work through us. And in the midst of this, this broken world, and, and we do go through our own things, but we also need to be present for others as well. Because that's how we can be Jesus. You see, Jesus didn't just give us the Holy Spirit to comfort us and to strengthen us. Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit that we might spread his love to others. And a big way we can do that is just by being present. Certainly we can do things for other people, but a lot of people just need, need your presence. They need to know that you care. And they need to know that you care in the same way Jesus did without judgment, without condemnation, without condition, but just that you love them because Jesus loved you. Amen? Now we're going to sing a song, um, but first I'll say a quick prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here together today. Thank you for the message that you gave us through your word. We ask that you just continue to bless us along our way. In Jesus' name, amen.